Japan to talk more with us about uh, global growth and central banks action is Leon Pereira of Spire Research and Consulting. Good morning, uh, Leon. The ECB and the Fed have administered extra uh, strong monetary painkillers. Does the global economy still need a lot more time to recover from its thumping debt hangover? Well, the U.S. Fed and the ECB have come out with some strong medicine. I think the announcements, the programs that they've announced uh, do mark a milestone. This strong medicine will create short-term effects, so it will move the needle on things that change in the short term. Stock market prices, uh, bond yields, and so on, things that are traded in the markets. The impact on things like GDP and broad measures of consumer spending, that will take much longer. The, the, the impact on the real economy, that will take much longer to make its effects felt. Uh, and also the path forward will not simply be a straight line moving upwards. There are some risks with these policies. For example, what the U.S. is doing uh, with the QE, there could be some risks in terms of weakening the dollar and increasing inflation. So it will really come down to how they execute these policies and what else happens to the world economy in the months forward uh, to produce real economic change. Okay, what about Europe? Has Mario Draghi's promise for the uh, ECB to stand ready to buy government bonds driven the bears from the continent? Well, I think it has to a very large extent. That announcement from the ECB plus the ruling by the German Constitutional Court that Germany can take part in a full rescue fund, these are real milestones in Europe's path out of the recovery. And what we can say is that there is light at the end of the tunnel right now. But it doesn't mean that the tunnel is a shorter tunnel. It's still a long tunnel. The Europeans will have to go through a long process of integration, starting with uh, banking regulation integration. There is a proposal on the table right now. And after that, there will be central banking integration and ultimately political integration. But I think what has changed, and this is very important, is that people can now see the path forward out of this crisis coming through greater integration. That's on the table, that's on the cards, you know, rather than the solution coming from an exit of Greece from the Eurozone, which would really not be in anyone's interests. So that's very significant. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Asia. The Bank of Japan ends its uh, two-day meeting on Wednesday. Is the BOJ under pressure to ease monetary policy further and weaken the yen? Well, I don't think the BOJ is under a huge amount of pressure. The economic situation now in Japan is not as bad as after the Fukushima earthquake or not as bad as after the economic meltdown in 2009. So the pressure is not that uh, great. Also, the BOJ doesn't really have a lot of tools that it uses in the way that the U.S. Fed uses. Interest rates are about zero. It doesn't have a history of making big quantitative easing moves in the way the U.S. Fed has done the last few years. So I don't think we can expect any big moves from the BOJ around the Japanese yen. Uh, China doesn't seem to, seem to have acted very forcefully to cushion uh, this year's slowdown in growth. Were you surprised by this? I was surprised. We were expecting a stimulus package that was less than what we saw in 2009, but more than what we're seeing now. We have to allow for the fact that there could be some stealth stimulus uh, happening in the market, stimulus that is taking place without big bang announcements, also, the stimulus that is happening takes some time to impact the real economy. But even allowing for those things, I think what we're seeing on the ground is not as big a stimulus as we were expecting. That is true. And this could be partly due to the political tensions uh, in China that are taking place in the run-up to the Communist Party Congress that's maybe holding back very big, bold, decisive action. Well, let's talk about uh, another point of tension, uh, the ongoing dispute between China and Japan right now. China and Japan actually uh, generated two-way trade of 345 billion U.S. dollars last year. Do you think the spat over the uh, uninhabited islands in the East China Sea uh, is going to hurt trade ties between the two countries? I mean, we've seen uh, a lot of problems uh, in the last few days. Well, I don't think in the short term the trade ties are going to be hurt for the simple reason that a lot of that trade is happening within companies. So it's really uh, Japanese companies' operations in China exporting finished products to Japan or J the Japanese headquarters uh, exporting parts and components for assembly into China. So it's really rooted in supply chains, and I think that isn't really going to change in the short term because it cannot. Uh, but in the medium term and the longer term, I think this is very significant. It is going to impact Japanese companies. They're going to try to put new investments in Asia outside of China to manage this increasing risk in places like Vietnam and India. We've already seen that happening after the rare earths incident that took place recently, and that trend is going to accelerate with what's happening right now. Uh, let's take a look at India. India's central bank kept its uh, benchmark interest rate on hold yesterday. Uh, why no monetary easing when growth is faltering to new lows? 
Well, the Indian Central Bank doesn't really have a history of making big interventions to help growth. They tend to leave that to the government of the day. They are much more focused on inflation. I think that is partly because India does have a big structural problem with inflation that's due to fiscal deficits, dependence on agricultural output, and so on. So they tend to really focus their firepower on the inflation issue. So even though growth is low, I think the burden of doing something about that growth is really going to fall to the government rather than the central bank. Okay, well, thanks so much indeed for that, Leon. That was Leon Pereira of Spire Research and Consulting, and that's a business wrap for me. Back over to Stephen Yvonne.